So I'm Jean Laurenceau. I'm director of research at the CNRS, National Center for Scientific Research. And I'm working here in a building called ICM, which is Institut Cerveau et Moelle Épinière. So here I developed a system, a technique, which allows people to write in cursive with the eyes. And so it's creative in the sense that they can generate the traces they want. Uh, it's not intrusive because uh, they just wear a small panel. The current eye tracking system, when they are used to communicate, uh, work in the following way. You have a bunch of letters on screen, A, C, whatever, and you fixate this, you blink to say, oh, this is this letter I want to select, and you go to another letter, so you write letter by letter, okay? And then le the letters are written in uh, a font which is chosen by the computer. In this display, what is nice is that you can choose to draw the way you want. Uh, so you can use the motor plan that you've learned during childhood to learn how to write. The way to record the movements of the eye is very simple. Uh, what you use is an eye tracker. This eye tracker is made of a camera which films the eye and then a computer analyzes the movement of the eye along the horizontal and vertical axis. So this is the technical side. The other side is to display on a screen something which is going to help eye movements. Eye movements are of two types. One is moving very quickly the eyes from one point to the next. This is what you do when you read. You jump from a word to another word, etc. Uh, another type of eye movements, which is necessary, is pursuit eye movements. And this is used when you track an object, like a bird flying in the sky or a car passing by. It turns out that those pursuit eye movements, you cannot do them, you cannot make them, you cannot produce or generate them if you don't have something to track. So the display is a weird thing. It is static, it doesn't move, but if you move the eye, it provides you with a visual illusion, a moving illusion, which goes with the eye. So then you enter a kind of feedback loop in which action, eye movements, are producing a visual illusion that goes in the direction of the eyes and which helps you to move the eyes into the good direction. So this is really like a donkey following a carrot. Yeah. The screen is simply made of a gray background. On that gray background, you put discs at random, you know, and then those discs are slightly lighter and become darker than the background. But they don't move, they are static on the screen. This is the core of the, of the story, and it is slightly difficult to understand. Normally, if I move my eyes from left to right, the background, which is static, is moving from right to left. So it shifts on the retina, but in the direction opposite to that of the eye. Uh, the illusion is such <coughs> that if you move the eye from left to right, the visual world, the background, which is static, seems, appears to move with the eye. Why is it so? Well, it is, it is the result of the activity of neurons in the brain that responds to mo motion, okay? And it turns out that those neurons cannot correctly analyze a movement if the uh, image is changing of contrast over time. And this was discovered in the 70s by Stuart Anstis, and he called this phenomenon reverse phi. So to make it clear, phi, phi motion is what you see when you go to the movie, Reverse phi is what you would see is the images would change their contrast over time. In, in normal life, in everyday life, you do everything you can to suppress the perception of those emotions which go in the wrong direction. But there, you want to look at them, you want to see them, you want to select those illusory motions, this illusory motion, and it's going to be the, the, the substrate on which you write. Uh, what is counterintuitive is the fact that some people see static disc and they say, hey, look, it's not moving. So they have 
If they can, they have to ignore the static aspect of the display and concentrate on the illusory motion. So they have really to change a little bit the way they look at the world to privilege the motion they see, they should see, and which is needed. For training, uh, it's like, you know, when you learn a new sport, you need to train. Training resembles that of surf. As I said, uh, in the display, it goes light, dark, light, dark. This is like up, down, when you are on a wave and you want to learn to surf. What you have to do is to do small movements to catch the wave. Okay, so this is the first step of training. So the second step is, oh, can I turn left, a little bit right, a little bit left? And this is the beginning of controlling and, you know, mastering eye movements. And the third step is, you know, when you become very good at surfing. And this is also uh, the third phase of training. And after that, well, you can do whatever you want. You can move your eyes, draw, write. You're free to do what you want. You know, I trained six naive observers, people that never trained before. Four of them were really able to control their eye movements. Training was three to five sessions. Some of them find it very difficult. It is possible that some others need more training, like, you know, 10 sessions. And, and, and we need to, to check this in the future. Because they, they were naive, they're not motivated to go further, I stopped the training there. So now I have to see uh, what's going on with people who are motivated because they need it or because they are willing to use it. And in particular, we are going to work with ELS, ALS patients and check and see whether they are willing to use it. You know, this is not sure. And then there are other partners which are associated, who are associated to uh, you know, process the traces so they can be recognized easily and written maybe on, on a printer um, or uh, to think about uh, artistic applications like, you know, making drawings or music and things like that. So these are going to be the next steps, starting now.